And now we return to the question and answer session from the program. The first question for Ralph Nader asked about impeachment and the reluctance of local Democrats to pursue impeachment in Congress. When the Democrats won in 2006 November, control of the Congress, first thing they did was take impeachment off the table. This is impeaching a president whose party stole the election from them in 2000 in Florida. You figure. The second question asked for Ralph Nader to comment on the U.S. use of depleted uranium. On depleted uranium? Yes. Yeah. Well, that's used, you know, uh, as a coating on shells to harden the shells, like tank artillery shells, and it leaves behind a pretty toxic, deadly environment. Kids are playing around in the soil and grass among trees. It should be a war crime. Uh, it, it should be like cluster bombs. Uh, cluster bombs are now uh, legal, and they tear apart mostly kids and civilians, and they stay there unexploded for years. Kids in South Lebanon think they look like toys, and they do look like toys when the Israelis left over a million of them uh, there in 2006. But there are now 100 countries who have signed on to a treaty to ban the production and uh, distribution and use of cluster bombs, depleted uranium should be on that list. Guess what? The United States is not one of those 100 countries because we produce and sell cluster bombs. Now, this is, it's the two parties. It isn't just one party. They're all very complicit with these kinds of situations. Yes. The next question for Ralph Nader asked about plans to create a liquid natural gas port on the coast of Oregon. We waste between 50 and 75 percent of our energy as judged by practical available technology today. So before we go into building nuclear plants and bringing liquefied natural gas and uh, huge tankers from abroad, why don't we put that money instead of in those forms of energy which are hazardous into energy efficient technologies like refrigerators, appliance, all kinds of appliances, air conditioning, heating systems, electric generating plants, motor vehicles, uh, because it reduces the sales for these industry. Conservation of energy reduces Exxon sales. You have a motor vehicle 70 miles per gallon, Exxon's gonna sell you less gasoline. So these corporations have a built-in vested interest against some competitors, little competitors who are trying to change things, in waste. And so anybody says, why sh should we invest in nuclear power, should we invest in liquid LNG? Let's invest first in reducing the waste of the energy we have. Uh, a megawatt of electricity you don't have to uh, waste is a megawatt you don't have to produce, whether by coal or any other form of fuel, as we convert our country uh, to the most benign forms of renewable energy, solar and geothermal. So you know if one of those LNG tankers goes up, goodbye Portland. I mean, if it's in the Bay of Portland. I mean, this is a huge, huge explosion, like bigger than Texas City a hundred and some years ago. The next question for Ralph Nader returned to the topic of impeachment. Why has there been no progress on impeachment, and how could we still accomplish that? Well, I've been talking with John Conyers, an old friend of mine, chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, so has former Senator McGovern and others, to have impeachment hearings. And when he said no, and Pelosi and Steny Hoyer uh, don't want it either, his, his superiors, I asked him why. And he said, well, he, he doesn't want to turn Bush into a victim. He doesn't want to distract from existing legislation Democrats are pushing, and he besides doesn't have the votes. Well, I said, on that grounds, John, there wouldn't have been a civil rights progress on Capitol Hill in Congress. Uh, so the real reason, I think, is, uh, is they don't have the fortitude uh, of their forebears. The Democrats were moving to certain impeachment and conviction of Nixon and Watergate. Watergate was a one-time episode. 
This happens every day. The war in Iraq, the spying, the throwing people in jail without habeas corpus protection, the torture. They're just, they're a different breed up there. And part of it is because we don't put any pressure on them. There are some groups pushing for impeachment. They have email lists and so on. But we're not putting enough pressure on them. We've put enough pressure on Conyers that he's now started torture hearings. But he doesn't want to use, use the word impeachment. So at least we've gotten to one impeachable offense without the dreaded word impeachment. What would James Madison and Thomas Jefferson? Uh, George W. Bush is exactly why they put the impeachment authority in the U.S. Constitution. But having read, pardon? Yes, as I said, as I said in the column that's on my website, on the website, votenator.org, it is never too late for impeachment. It is never too late to bring these people to justice. Uh, and uh, this idea, I mean, they can, they can move very fast if they want. Their files are full with documents, incriminating materials, the, the official reports, the, the, the whistleblowers, the people who testify under oath. Well, Bush has admitted to two impeachable offenses without using the phrase. One is spying on Americans without judicial warrant, a five-year prison term maximum felony, and imprisoning Americans without charges. I mean, that's a, that's a matter of record. So he's an easily impeachable president. But you've raised Congress. The way we turn this country around, the one easy way, is to control Congress, 535 men and women who put their shoes on every day like you do, 1,500 corporations who don't have a single vote get their way with the majority of these 535 men and women. And we've got the vote back in the district. If you develop uh, Congress watchdog groups in every congressional district, 1,000 people out of 650,000 in a congressional district. That's all. 1,000 people, $100 each, 100 hours each, volunteer, full-time staff, uh, and full-time office in each congressional district pushing these major redirections that are long overdue and supported by the American people, like uh, single-payer health insurance, you cannot believe how fast they turn around. There's nothing out there back home. You got the special interests and the commercial interests and the single-issue people. You don't have people pushing for the general interest. You would be stunned how fast they would turn around. Because the only, the only thing they really want is votes. Uh, and, and they raise a lot of money because they think they can get votes by advertising and so on. But we've got the votes. We just haven't used it in a structured way. Imagine having your representatives in this auditorium six times a year, and you lay the agenda. And they know you represent tens of thousands of people in each district on these long overdue changes for the American people. How many people would like to belong to such a Congress watchdog group? It's great. Listen, it isn't even as intense as professional bird watchers. <laughs> Have you ever met a serious bird watcher? <laughs> Up at dawn, into the marshes, binoculars, cameras, pads, pencils. Imagine if we had that intensity watching Congress. Yes. The next audience member asked Ralph Nader to comment on the national debt. Huge. Bush is basically making the children and grandchildren of America pay for the war. It's $14 million an hour, 24 hours a day, the war in Iraq. Just think, $14 million an hour, and it's financed by deficit spending. In every other war in America's history, the President and the Congress have raised taxes to pay for it, but not this one. So when, they, when, when Bush says, I'm not going to cut your taxes, he's basically saying, I'm going to increase the taxes at a horrendous level for your children and grandchildren. He has, do you know that 80% of the entire $9, 10 trillion dollar debt, uh, deficit debt, uh, was under Republican presidents, like Reagan and Bush. <laughs> They're the ones who really know how to build up deficits. And we don't make that, Enough of that because, well, it's in the future. Maybe they'll inflate the dollar and pay it off that way. But you know who pays when you inflate the dollar? 
the average consumer. That's a dangerous way to do it, print money. Uh, I don't know what's wrong with our level, uh, low level of civic indignation. I really don't. I, I attribute it, I mean, we've all got our theories, right? I mean, who really knows? I think we've been beaten into the ground from when we're three years old, uh, being taught to believe and not to think, not having any civic skill courses in our elementary and high school so we have a sense of practicing democracy and challenging power, and spending 50 hours a week watching screens. You know, television, internet, video. What does that do to the brain other than reduce attention span? Something's happening to us. Uh, we have great communication capability. We can reach each other free through the internet, all kinds of ways to gather people, and it's not happening. That's why I was talking to Google yesterday about. It's not happening. People actually had huge rallies without any electricity or anything. I, you know, during the campaign, I was toying with having one county in, in Colorado where people would campaign for us using no technology that, uh, that was, that, using no technology that was available for the last 108 years. So they have to use horses, and they have to use word of mouth, and they have to use their feet. And I said to myself, you know, I think, I think they'd actually get a higher vote for me if they used horses door to door and had gatherings in living rooms by knocking on doors and passing out leaflets. It's really getting very, very strange what this virtual reality of communications and internet is doing to us. We retrieve information, it's great. Tell you about a meeting, it's great. But mobilizing citizens is too cool. It's too cool a medium. Yes. The next question for Ralph Nader asked about the consequences of the expanded executive power and authorities here in the United States and what might be some solutions to that expanded authority. Well, that's what the 9-11 uh, strike did for Bush. He turned it into a huge concentrator of power in the White House at the expense of Congress and the judiciary, diverted attention from the necessities of the people and made his corporate buddies very rich and chilled out the Democrats. We are two major terrorist attacks from a police state because our reaction as a people is not to heed Benjamin Franklin, who said those who trade freedom for security deserve neither. And you get someone in the White House after a major terrorist strike, they can concentrate huge power in the White House and move into a police state dragnet type of action. Look at what's happened after 9-11. I mean, the British were bombed by the Nazis every night in London from September 1939 to April, May 1940, and they didn't give up their uh, liberties the way we've given them up. So we, gotta, we have to be very worried about the terrorists abroad who see the way we have trembled and somersaulted and spent trillions of dollars and gotten ourselves in a nervous breakdown and followed this messianic militarist in the White House with one strike. They're saying, God, you know, he sort of blew our wad on this one strike. We had no second strike capability. But can you imagine what we did to this powerful country? And if we're not ready for that, to defend our constitutional system and habeas corpus and due process and our freedom, uh, it's, it's, you'll never recognize this country after two major terrorist strikes stateless terrorist strikes. And Bob Barr, running for the Libertarian now, he's very worried about that too. Much more worried about than Republican Democrat. Yes. The next question asks, what moral obligation do we have to the people of Iraq? Great, great moral obligation. That's why, uh, yeah, we broke them. And that's why we must continue humanitarian aid we knocked the bottom out of the insurgency by giving them back their country and their oil in a negotiated six-month withdrawal. I know a lot about that area. I specialized in it. I studied the language. Uh, they will resist forever our occupation, just the way we would if we were occupied. And, and when, a, when, a foreign, when a foreign country occupies another country and prefers one sectarian group against another, Boom, it's going to explode. Revenge, killing, slaughter, and so on. 
Imagine if a giant military power came and preferred Protestants against Catholics, threw the Catholics out of work, etc., uh, threw them in prison. Boom, it would explode. Even though they were neighbors and they intermarried as Shiites and Sunnis uh, did. And, you know, they had doctrinal differences, but it was no big deal. They went to many of the same mosques. They, never, they didn't fight each other for 1,300 years, as the propagandists, neocons, like to tell us. We owe them humanitarian aid, um, but we've got to get out of their lives so they can. That's why I use the word negotiated. So we can sit them down and say, look, you know what the alternative is. It's nightmare. We're going to give you back your oil, your country. You all have a stake. The tribal leaders, the religious leaders still have a lot of authority. And uh, we're going to continue humanitarian aid. It'll cost the American taxpayer a fraction of the $14 million an hour. It's now costing and not counting the blood of American soldiers. Uh, I think that's the way to do it. They don't believe us now when they hear our government say, well, we'll get out of Iraq, you know, we'll deploy fewer troops. They just don't believe us. We got 22 bases there. Three of them are multi-billion dollar bases as if they're out of the Starship Galactica or something. I mean, really modern, heavy stuff. <laughs> they just don't believe we're gonna ever leave and they're just going to do more and more to try to get us out of there. We owe them a huge debt. They never threatened us. You've got 25% of the country refugees, two, half of the 25% in Jordan and Syria. Nobody ever pays much attention to them. And uh, there is severe malnutrition, infant mortality, da dangerous streets, diseased drinking water, have food problems. It's horrible. You know, shells, bombs, cluster bombs, everywhere. It's horrible. And so we do owe them that. We owe them, and by the way, there are about 50 to 100,000 of them that collaborated with us. They were the translators. They're the ones who risked their lives uh, to, to help uh, the soldiers topple Saddam. They never dreamed that it would continue. And we won't let any of them in this country. We let 150 to 200,000 Vietnamese in this country after we blew that country apart. And we've only let 6,000 in Iraqis who risked their lives and often saved the, our lives of our soldiers by telling them, watch out this, don't go down this alley. You know Sweden, how many Iraqis, Sweden? Little Sweden, little Sweden, eight million people. They've let in 22,000 Iraqis, refugees. We won't even let in the ones that helped save American soldiers' lives. So it's just cruel. Uh, the, the, uh, no wonder they hate us over there. They don't, they hate who represents us. The next question for Ralph Nader asks, what suggestions do you have for tort reform here in America? See, my main concern is that wrongfully injured people by toxic chemicals in the workplace or defective cars or whatever, you've read about a lot of the products, get compensation from their perpetrators and deter future perpetrators. 90% of the people who are wrongfully injured don't even file a claim. The total amount of money spent in this country to compensate the victims of product defects is less than what we spend on dog food. It's about $7 billion. And the same is true for medical malpractice. So my concern is, and I share that with the physicians who studied medical malpractice at the Harvard School of Public Health years ago, is not that there are too many lawsuits, there are too few. And now that doesn't mean we can't make the system more efficient. It doesn't mean if lawyers take too big a share on a contingent fee or insurance companies, we can't deal with that problem. But our first priority has to be the quadriplegic, the paraplegic. How are they gonna sustain themselves the rest of their lives if you have a cap on pain and suffering? Uh, a, a child injured for life, age four, their parents are not going to be around for the expected life and expectancy. So actually, the amount of money that changes hands is ridiculously small when you consider the injuries and the size of our economy and how much money the casualty insurance companies are making. They're setting record profits, 
year after year. The trial lawyers only get paid if they win. It's called a contingent fee. They should never get more than one third. Some of them go for a 40. They should never get more than one third, in my judgment. But they don't get paid at all if they spend hundreds of hours and the court rules against them. I wish doctors practiced that way. <laughs> uh, they only get paid when they heal you, you know. Uh, uh, so uh, I, I think the, the system is one that doesn't deal with the great number of people who never get any justice for the wrongdoers who harm them. That's my main criticism of the system. But I think when you make perpetrators pay, you internalize those costs, and they and their colleagues tend to become, and their companies tend to become more careful. Yes, thank you. The next question for Ralph Nader mentions a statement by Harry Reid on The Daily Show. Reid provided this excuse for not ending the Iraq War. The Democrats don't have a majority. What do you think about this explanation for why the Democrats haven't ended the war? For not ending the war? Yes. They can stop uh, the funding of the war, except to return the soldiers <laughs> here, safely. Yeah. That, that's for affirmatively voting to end the war. But when the appropriations bills come, they can block them until, keep blocking them until the right one. <laughs> comes. The Republicans do that to them all the time. It's called the filibuster. So, ah, uh, these politicians, Harry is slippery here. <laughs> the next question for Ralph Nader asks about health care. Americans spend twice the percentage of their GDP as any other Western country on health care, and they get less. The main difference, this audience member says, is the litigation Shouldn't tort reform be a major part of the solution to the health care crisis here in the United States? Well, health care cost $2.2 trillion last year. The tort system, verdicts and settlements, and medical malpractice, $7 billion. This audience member argued that it's all about the costs involved in avoiding getting sued. No, no, that's propaganda. Anybody, any doctor tells you that he does an invasive test on you, in order to avoid the prospect of litigation, is committing malpractice himself. You see? I mean, that, that violates medical ethics. That's not just my opinion. They like to say that because nobody likes to be sued. Look, you don't like to be sued, I don't like to be sued, doctors don't like to be sued. How would you like to live in a country where nobody was sued? Huh, let's see, uh, Soviet Union, uh, communist China, fascist dictators. Uh, if we don't have the right to sue, we don't have the right to get our just compensation for injuries, and we don't have a right to disclose bad practices in hospitals, which might get them to shape up, and we don't have the right to deter future recklessness, like hospital-induced infections that are killing 200 uh, Americans a day, according to the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta. The right to sue is so basic that it was number two on the protest list of our founding patriots against King George the third, They said, he's trying to take away our right of trial by jury. The first one was no taxation without representation. And you're right, the US healthcare industry spends, uh, it costs $7,100 per capita. And in places like Australia and England and Switzerland, it's less than half that, imagine. And in those countries, they cover everybody. In our country, 7,100 compared to 3,400 in Switzerland covers everybody. 7,100, you have 50 million people without coverage and many more undercovered or full of exclusions, deductions, co-payment, you name it. It is a terribly inefficient uh, system that's been condemned in, by one report after the other, Harvard Medical school professors, people who practice medicine, people who study this, 59% of the physicians in a poll last month won a single-payer health insurance system, similar to Canada's. And uh, Canada and Western Europe have far better outcomes. They have higher life expectancy, lower infant mortality. 
the outcomes of the system. Nobody dies in these country because they can't afford health care. That's not true in the United States. It's good to raise that point because most people think if you get single payer full Medicare for all, it's going to cost more. What do you mean it's going to cost more? Other countries do it for half. You look at the wages in Switzerland. This is no third world country. They pay top wages. They're very comparative. Um, can't say, oh, well, you know, this is, this is Malaysia. The doctor works for 10,000 a year. It's a horribly inefficient, perverse system of perverse incentives. Uh, over over uh, diagno uh, 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 over uh, drugging people, too many prescriptions, uh, too many unnecessary operations. Uh, the system has been documented by reports, by 60 Minutes, Wall Street Journal. We don't need any more details. We've got to make it a system that, one, gets rid of those huge administrative expenses of Aetna, and the single payer is much more efficient. Two, it gives you free choice to doctor and hospital. Three, it eliminates over $200 billion, and this can be well documented, of computerized billing fraud and abuse, because there's so many different payors and insurance companies and cross-billing and fooling around with codes. Single payer, you don't see a bill. Single payer. The government is the insurer, and you have private delivery of medical services under cost and quality controls. It's going to blow a hole through the roof. You know, when I started looking at this, uh, when Medicare came in 1964, uh, the health care costs this country 3% of the gross domestic product. It's now 16%. It'll be 20% in another five, six years. It's going to devour the economy. There's really no end to it, <laughs> other than some cataclysmic economic cliff fall. And still you have tens of millions of people not covered. So you don't want to blame... Uh, the tort system, that is one of the distractions. If you got, if you got really hurt, uh, look every day, look, doctors ha and hospitals have to make m millions and millions of critical decisions every day. You just have one or two percent, or five to 10% of the doctors who are incompetent, which is about the, the level. They shouldn't even be practicing medicine. You get a lot of people hurt, there are people who, you know, the wrong organ is taken out. There are people who are cavalierly diagnosed as, okay, you can go back home, and they got cancer. And eight months later, it's critical. Uh, we just can't countenance that kind of system. It's got to be held responsible and accountable. Yes. The next audience member asks, what should I say to folks who say that supporting you will end up giving the election to the Republicans? I don't have to tell you what you say. You probably got 20 answers. <laughs> I mean, what, why do you have to be apologetic? They expect you to be apologetic when they're not apologetic for supporting warmongers and people who turn the country over uh, to corporations. Uh, you see, this is, a, this, this is all part of the political bigotry inherent in a two-party elected dictatorship that basically says to small challengers, uh, we don't want you on the ballot. Why are you running? Don't run. Shut up. Don't use the First Amendment, which is what you do when you run for election, free speech, petition, and assembly, the consummate use of the First Amendment. It's political bigotry. They did this to minority voters years ago. They're doing it to small party and independent candidates now. That's what we have to break. If we don't get more voices and choices, guess what? We just get more of the same. Uh, as far as uh, the amazing thing about these liberals, this is what happens when you're a prisoner of a 220-year-old rotten electoral system that most people in the Western world can't even understand. Do you know what the electoral rules here and what you can do and what you can't do, and initiative and get on the ballot in Oregon, it's a nightmare, a nightmare to preserve the exclusive control of your vote by those two parties. And they're gonna, they want to tell you, you either vote for us or you stay home. They don't even like binding none of the above, which was my favorite reform, where you can go down and vote no to both of them. If you get more none of the above, cancels the election and gets new elections. Uh, so, 
Uh, but take Florida. Florida was stolen uh, by the Republicans uh, from Tallahassee to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court selected Bush. He wasn't elected. They stopped the Florida Supreme Court from completing a statewide recount. Just think of that. Five, four, the Republicans were the five. It was a clear political hack decision. All right. So the Democrats who blame the Greens, when you ask them, who won in 2000? They'll all say Gore. What happened in Florida? It was stolen from them. You mean they were thieves, right. So why don't you go after the thieves instead of the Green Party that shares a lot of your political agenda? It's crazy. So, uh, so be, because they don't, didn't go after the thieves in Florida, they got an encore in Ohio in 2004. The Republican dominated state. Guess what? They had voting machines unused piled in the warehouse under the direction of Secretary of State Blackwell. And they had plenty of voting machines for Republican dominated districts and precincts and shortages of voting machines for the Democrats. So you had four, eight, ten hour lines in places like Kenyon, Ohio, downtown Cleveland, Oberlin, where they're Democrats. Huh? Damn College. Yeah, excuse me. Yeah, at the yeah. We're Kenyan we're Kenyan College students, right? And so a lot of them just peeled off. You know, they have to pick up the kids, go to work, go to class. That's just one of twenty ways the Republicans got Ohio, and Ohio was a swing state. If Kerry won Ohio, he'd have been president. I mean, the Democrats have to look at themselves in the mirror and stop looking for scapegoats. They have to look at themselves in the mirror. Why they haven't been able to landslide for 25 years the most craven Republican Party in the Republican Party's history. That's the, that's the question they got to ask. Why have they become so good at electing such bad Republicans? Let's put it that way. Yes. The next audience member asks, how can we undo the damage done by the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA? Well, the World Trade Organization, NAFTA, have a signatories. There's a provision in the trade agreement that says you can pull out, the U.S. can pull out with six months' notice and renegotiate it. These trade agreements reverse the way we progressed in our country. The way we progressed in our country was to tell corporations that even though they think they can make more profit by producing unsafe products or hiring child labor earlier in the 20th century, uh, they can't do that. They have to subordinate their commercial priorities to human rights, labor rights, environmental rights, auto safety rights. That's the way we progress. Now what NAFTA and WTO do, very cleverly, this is really a silent coup d'etat by the corporations, and uh, Polls show Americans opposed both of them when they were going through Congress. They smelled something bad. Is they subordinate to trade, to commerce, labor, environmental, consumer. So that we had five environmental regulations that were challenged under the World Trade Organization in the secret courts in Geneva, Switzerland by foreign countries who said, your environmental regulations are so strict they're restricting imports into your country from our country. Therefore, you violated the trade agreement. We've lost all five. We have to change it. So that's why we've got to get rid of these trade agreements. They're secretive. They're autocratic. They bypass our courts. They strip us of sovereignty that is, is, is not necessary. All trade agreements, you lose some sovereignty. Uh, and they subvert our democracy. They are creations of multinational corporations to pull down our standard of living by allowing unimpeded trade to trample environmental, worker, and consumer laws, and to go to dictatorships uh, without any tariffs or without any labor or environmental standards, where they exploit their workers, but the workers work hard with brand new equipment, and they ship it back in this country. That's the deal. That's what they're doing. And so whenever you get someone say, NAFTA and WTO are free trade, and free trade is good for everyone. Tell them this. You can't have free trade with dictators, because dictators determine suppressed labor conditions, suppressed labor costs, how much you're free to pollute, not the marketplace. In China, 
the dictatorship keeps the wages down, smashes efforts for independent trade unions. That's the one answer they don't know how to reply to you on. So if you want to cut it short in an argument, just say, you can't have free trade with dictatorships. I'm just curious as to how, how as a country we're ever going to repair this, this, the damage that's been done over the past, like, decades. Well, the lost jobs are the lost jobs. I mean, a lot of the auto industry went into Mexico and is moving to China, electronics industry moving to China. Uh, but what we can do is change these trade agreements, and even now Obama and Clinton are talking about changing the trade agreements. Not that they will, but they never even talked about it, because they feel the heat from workers when they campaign. <laughs> Hollowed out communities, shut down factories. Uh, the conditions that they're observing in their campaign tours put the lie uh, to the theory behind these trade agreements, that it's, that it's a win-win situation for everybody. Yes. The next audience member described some recent comments by Norman Solomon. Solomon mentioned Nader's campaign and said that the corporations love Ralph Nader. This audience member was shocked by these comments, but explained that Solomon was arguing that Nader was going to take votes from the Democrats and we would end up with corporate cheerleaders in office. See, this, yeah, I, I've talked to him. He and I are almost on the same wavelength on all these issues, but he's against our candidacy. So I say to him, Norman, um, do you agree with our agenda? Yeah. Then uh, you support us? No. Uh, then uh, do you support uh, the Democrats? Yes. Why? Because the Republicans are horrible. Uh, have you been critical of the Democrats? <laughs> like every week in his life. Uh, so why are you supporting the Democrats? Because uh, we got to get rid of Bush and the Republicans. So are you making any demands on the Democrats? Are you trying to make your Democrats better so they can landslide the Republicans with a mandate from back home? They don't ever make any demands. All these liberal groups supported John Kerry. We checked all their websites, 19 of them, women's rights, anti-war, labor, all the rest. Didn't make a single demand on John Kerry. You don't want to upset him. He's saying he wants more soldiers in Iraq. You don't want to undermine him from the left. That's the point. If they don't make John Kerry better, he gets worse and he fuzzes himself with Bush and he didn't have the bright lines and he loses to this guy who's 28% in the polls. Uh, so Norman Solomon, dear Norman, what you've got to do is ask yourself the question, why don't you try to put pressure on the Democrats using our candidacy, if you'd like, as leverage, and why don't you say to the Democrats, why don't you say to Democrats, if you don't like the Nader Gonzalez candidates, why don't you pick up living wage? Why don't you take their whole agenda? They keep sending it to you. Yeah. The, you know what I. Yeah. I mean, the nerve of Norman Solomon saying the corporations like me. Uh, why don't they? Why doesn't he go and interview the corporations and see how much they like me? Uh, now, the, the thing is. Uh, the, the thing is this, don't have any patience with these people. These are wittingly or unwittingly politically bigoted people. He runs a press newsletter that fights for free speech and dissent, and he's trying to shut us down. This is the consummate hypocrisy of the nose ring liberal who provides the corporate Democrats with the tether. Right. I wish, uh, I wish he was here on the stage, and I'd give him 10 minutes to try to defend himself. There's no defense. you either for the First Amendment or you're not for the First Amendment. Remember the old saying? You believe in the First Amendment when you defend the right of someone you disagree with to speak. Well, he doesn't even defend my right to agree with him on the issues because he is a nose ring liberal with the tether. I mean, this is a very serious problem, and the liberals and progressives who have that attitude are never going to win. They don't know how to bargain. They don't know leverage. They give their votes for granted to the least worst. And when they say to the Democrats, well, we've criticized you, but you're not as bad as the Republicans. Here's our vote. Take it. They get taken. You don't make the Democrats better, you're going to end up with 
the Republicans winning or the Democrats winning like Republicans. That's what it comes down to. To try to get that through their heads is very difficult because bigotry is very difficult to change. Yes. The next audience member also commented on how Ralph Nader was accused of taking votes away from Al Gore in the 2000 election. Exactly. I, Gore took far more votes away from me. And Bush took far more votes away from Gore. And a quarter of a million registered Democrats in Florida voted for Bush in 2000. And everything else the same. If Gore won his home state in Tennessee, he'd have been president. If he won Clinton in Arkansas, he'd have been president. If the mayor of Miami didn't take off to Madrid and not bring out his votes because he has a grudge, he had a grudge with the Democratic Party, he'd have won Florida even with all the thievery. Why are they picking on the Greens? Because they cannot stand to look at themselves in the mirror. And they cannot stand the fact that they can no longer defend America against the worst Republican Party in its history. That's what's at stake here. This is a corrupt, decaying party where the better parts of it, the liberal and progressives, are playing along with them. I mean, as long as Republicans control the left in this country, such as it is, the liberals, simply by becoming worse. Republicans become worse. They both dial for the same corporate dollars, Republican, Democrat. So the Democrats say, hey, we can become a little worse too, because the Democrat, Republicans are worse. And that's the way it is. Every four years, both of the parties get worse. Both of the parties get worse. You got to strip them of their excuses. You don't like challenges from the, liberal, the progressive side, take the agenda. The old Democratic Party would have taken this entire agenda, except the Middle East issues. They would have taken single payer health, that was Truman, living wage, it was Roosevelt, Truman. All these issues are old Democratic Party issues. So why don't they adopt them and landslide the Republicans? Because they are corporate Democrats. They dial for the same dollars. They're, they're interested in self-perpetuation of their jobs rather than the well-being of the American people. Have somebody as intelligent as Norman Solomon making a statement like this? This is, this is the decay of the liberals and of the progressives. I mean, how, why don't they think about all these people who are dying in this country, who the Democrats don't lift a finger to say, worker, workplace disease, hospital negligence, all that. They don't do anything about it. OSHA was dead in the water under Clinton. Dead in the water. Not one single chemical control standard in eight years. He never, they never demanded the auto companies to make their cars more fuel efficient. Eight years, they didn't propose it. How many times do we give them? How many years do we give them? Who cares about these parties? It's the people who are suffering, who are deprived, who are dislocated, who are cheated, who are harmed. That's who we should care about. Yeah. The next questioner raised concern about how the Bush administration was classifying presidential papers as personal property and so preventing them from going into the public record. He asks if Ralph Nader will talk about this as part of the debates being sponsored by the Google Corporation. Yeah, we are the greatest advocates of the Freedom of Information Act. That's public property. And that shouldn't be put in these presidential libraries. Uh, where they can be subject to copyright and restriction to historians or reporters or citizens. Uh, I don't know how long that's, that's going to last. That may, that may not be something that he, he's going to make stick. There's a group called the National Archives. It's a citizen group that tries to deal with that. We have sued, for example, to, to get a lot of Nixon papers out. We've succeeded with that under the Freedom of Information Act. Now, with electronic stuff, it becomes a little bit more complicated, but it's good that you raise that, because that's when you re can really evaluate the guts of a presidency with those papers. I don't think a lot of Americans know that the uh, executive order even exists. So would, would you bring it up in the Google debates? Well, yeah, I mean, I'm among a thousand other things. You, you have to pick and choose, you know. <laughs> I'll bring up freedom, freedom, <laughs> freedom of information. <clears throat> against government secrecy, because that's central to it. Executive order can be overturned by another executive order. It doesn't even require an act of Congress. So it makes it easy that way, for a succeeding president, that is. Yes? The next audience member asked how Ralph Nader would deal with the problem of peak oil. 
Um, unfortunately, I don't agree with the peak oil theory because the higher the price goes, after all, you know, the price per barrel of oil was $40 a barrel two, three years ago. It's now $123 as of yesterday. Uh, the higher the price goes, the more they can go into tar sands, the more they can go into low-grade reserves, the more they can recover or <coughs> wells that were exhausted by definition of 20, 30 barrel oil, but, are, but they can go get it at 100 barrel oil. There's a lot of hydrocarbon in the world. And, and un unfortunately, we've got to have a different attitude, which is we've got thousands of years of hydrocarbon. We cannot use it, whether it's coal, oil, gas, tar sands, because of the global climate issue, acid rain, all the things that we know about. So when, when you say peak oil, uh, it doesn't take into account the ability of the oil cartel and the oil companies and the New York mercantile chain speculators from driving it up to 200 barrels, $200 a, a barrel. That's one of the predictions now. It's going to go to $6, $7 a gallon. And that means they can go into the Alberta tar sands and into the shale in West Virginia, wreck the environment, uh, and because they get such a high price, uh, they can spend a lot of money getting those low-grade reserves. They're low-grade reserves, but they're huge. The amount, of <clears throat> the amount of oil in the tar sands in Alberta is equivalent to the oil in Saudi Arabia. But you should see the wreckage that's going on in Alberta. Can we have another one, please? The next question for Ralph Nader had to do with the recent meeting by Jimmy Carter with representatives of Hamas. Whereas Barack Obama had expressed a willingness to meet with world leaders that the Bush administration had refused to talk to, he criticized Jimmy Carter for the meeting with Hamas. The audience member asked Ralph Nader to comment on this apparent inconsistency. Well, that, that's Obama's problem, isn't it? That he, he says on the one hand, if he's president, he'll meet with uh, heads of state who uh, are our adversaries, or we consider them our adversaries, but then when Jimmy Carter, who's the best friend Israel ever had in the United States, he's really a great ex-president, goes and meets with Hamas, which 64% of the Israelis want the Israeli government to negotiate with, he, he backs off. Obama says, I wouldn't do that. You know, I, don't, I don't agree with that. See, there's no political fortitude here. He's a smart guy. He, he taught constitutional law. He knows the score. He knows who has the power. Who knows who doesn't have the power? He has a sense of justice and justice. He doesn't have the guts. I've watched him as a senator. He's not a transforming senator. He isn't a third of Senator Wellstone. He doesn't have the guts. And if you're in the White House, you've got to be a transforming leader to turn this country around. That's the problem with him. Yes. The next audience member asked, how can I support you without helping to elect John McCain? Uh, very simple. Whatever you do in the voting booth is your business. No one will know, right? But what you can do in May, June, July is say to Obama and millions like you, uh, we're not going to vote for you unless you come out with a specific living wage that is at least the purchasing power of 1968 minimum wage, which is 10 bucks, for example, or 12 bucks. And unless you do this in the Middle East, unless you attack the military budget, which is swarming with what Eisenhower warned about, the military-industrial complex. They're eating the heart. Unless you challenge these corporations, they're eating the heart and soul out of America after benefiting from taxpayers and the sweat of workers and put demands on them. Now, in your mind, you want Obama to win. The way to make him win is to vote for him in November. You don't have to signal it in May, June, July. Play a little poker, for heaven's sake. <laughs> say, say, yeah, flirt with the Nader Gonzalez ticket. Have two buttons. Say, I'm for Obama if Obama adopts the Nader Gonzalez agenda. As a follow-up, the audience member asked Ralph Nader if he would promise not to run in swing states. No, of course. Do you think I would disrespect the voters in these campaigns? Oh, up until now, I was going to classify you as a superb civil libertarian. Now what you want me to do is say, 
Well, I'm not going to give voters in these swing states a chance to vote for me because I'm really a, a dark horse candidate for Obama or Clinton or whatever. No, 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 no. When you run, you respect all the people in all the states. I go into 50 states, and that, that's what it is. Uh, because, because it's about the voter having a choice. I, I'm, gonna, I'm trying to get on all these ballots in order to give our voters a chance to vote for us, and then I, suddenly I say, I'm out of Florida and Ohio. Sorry, folks, you know. And you just, now, that destroys any integrity to third party and independent candidates in the future. In, in, the, in the 19th century, in the 19th century, when it was easy to get on the ballot, all these little parties never won a national election. But are we ever glad that the voters vote, some voters voted for the anti-slavery, and labor, farmer, women's right to vote? No one today who says, don't vote for Nader Gonzalez because the Republicans are worse than the Democrats, would ever say to you that they're glad, they're angry, that there are voters who voted for the Liberty Anti-Slavery Party instead of going for the least worst between the Whigs and the Democrats. Now, see, it's okay. They're all right on the 19th century. It's just the 21st century. They have trouble with more voices and choices. The other thing is there are about 39 states that are slam dunk uh, Republican or Democrat. So what's the excuse of people who want to send them a message? I, I'd be campaigning in Texas, and they'd come up to me and say, uh, we don't want Bush to win. Uh, we'd like to vote for you, but we don't want Bush to win. I said, in Texas? <laughs> I mean, give me a break. Kerry never went to Texas one day. It was gone for Bush. People need to be more strategic. You know, someone said, how smart would you like American voters to be? Here's my answer. As smart as they are as sports fans. <laughs> they know the record, the strategy, the tactics, so on and so forth. The next audience member asked, if we root out all the corruption in our government, would there be anything left? <laughs> yeah. There'd be, there'd be something left, but it would be efficient, responsive, and it would wake up every day and say, this is a government of, by, for the people, instead of of the General Motors, by the Exxons, for the DuPonts, to put it in a, a few words. Uh, the, the other thing that's important, I hope when you leave this auditorium that Congress watchdog idea lingers in your mind. You change Congress, you change the federal government, you change the federal government, a lot of good things can happen. Yes. The next audience member asked Ralph Nader, could you comment on our currency system, the move away from the gold standard, and the role of the Federal Reserve? Yeah, we're the only Western country that doesn't have an accountable central bank. The Federal Reserve is our central bank it's a powerful regulator on, on behalf of the financial interests of this country, and it's funded by the banks. It's not funded by your tax dollars. So they can thumb their nose at Congress uh, or anybody in Congress that wants to hold them accountable. As far as a currency, a fiat currency, that takes a long time. <laughs> we have a lot of international currency speculation. It's getting out of hand. It's cr creating a lot of lost jobs and dislocations and recessions, because it's being speculated, just like the dollar now, it's being speculated. I don't know if we can go back to the gold standard, uh, and I don't know whether we're going to go back to fixed currency rates by law, um, but something has to be done about out of control international currency speculation, trillions of dollars a day, and it affects real people, it affects real people, it's not just up there in the ether. Yes. The next audience member asked what it would look like to dismantle the system that we currently have in the United States for health care. What are the implications of getting rid of a health care system based on private insurance companies? That's a good point. Yeah. H676, HR 676, uh, pays attention to that. It's called a conversion program because you're going to unemploy a couple million people, bookkeepers, accountants, health insurance employees. And uh, uh, look that up. Look up Physicians for a National, what is it? Physicians for what, Matt? Healthcare physicians for a Health Care Program. They address that too. Uh, and 
That's part of it. I mean, you can't just leave these people off. There are a lot of jobs that need to be done in this country that people can be tra retrained for. Um, and um, it's a good question, and I, I can't go into any great detail, but it has not been ignored. Yes. The next question for Ralph Nader asked him to comment on who was behind the 9-11 attacks. Okay. Whatever, whoever you think caused 9-11, it was a terrorist attack. Okay, so let's, let's not. That's 3,000 civilians who were killed. It's not as many civilians in Hiroshima or Nagasaki or Dresden or what the Stalinists have done and Hitler and all the rest of it, but it was a terrorist attack. Uh, my point was, we're not ready to defend our democracy from another terrorist attack because it's too weak. It's been brought to its knees. We've lost a lot of liberty and freedom and due process uh, already. And charlatan politicians can take away our liberty under the guise of advancing our security. And if you do that, you can't advance your security. That's what Benjamin Franklin was talking about. Those who are willing to trade freedom for security deserve neither. Last question. Last question. The final question for Ralph Nader asked for his opinion of people who changed their party affiliation to vote for the lesser of two evils. Voters can do whatever they want. I try to persuade them. I just want to give voters uh, more candidates on the ballot, more agendas, more accomplishments, more choice. You've been listening to a lecture by consumer advocate, author, and presidential candidate, Ralph Nader. Ralph Nader spoke at the Benson High School Auditorium in Portland, Oregon, on May 13, 2008. To find out more about Ralph Nader and his work, please visit the Ralph Nader website at www.nader.org. To find out more about the Nader-Gonzalez presidential ticket, please visit their campaign website at www.votenader.org. This program was produced by PDX Justice Media Productions. To find out more about our work, please visit our website at www.pdxjustice.org. You'll find streaming video and audio programs featuring speakers such as Susan Faludi, Phyllis Bennis, Paul Krugman, Amira Haas, Norman Finkelstein, Diana Butu, and many others. If you'd like to comment on any of our programs, please write to us at pdxjustice at riseup.net. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for tuning in, and thanks for supporting listener-sponsored radio, public access cable television, net neutrality, and all forms of grassroots, democratic, community media.